Good morning, everybody. How are you all doing? I'm very sorry about yesterday. Uh, we, um, yeah, it was a bit of a funny day, really. We had to call in um, a fire crew because I got uh, trapped under all this hair. Um, no, I'm just joking. It's gone a bit weird today. Um, uh, no, uh, it was my wife's birthday yesterday, and um, I thought it was a bit unfair for me to come up here uh, when I was trying to make her have a really special day, and she did have a lovely day. Nothing to do with me, really. It was just, it was a lovely day. It was very sunny here in Norwich, and we just spent most of it in the garden with the music on, drinking lots of tea. Well, she drank some wine. I was drinking tea, and um, yeah, just having a nice time, really. Um, so happy birthday, Becky. I love you very much. And uh, yeah, I am very sorry. Um, uh, so I promised I'd make up for it today. So I'm going to try and get through a few chapters today of Escape from Furnace Fugitives. So Alex and Z and Simon have escaped from Furnace. There are police everywhere and armed police everywhere uh, trying to um, try to round up all of the escaped inmates. And there are hundreds of escaped inmates. And they, uh, Alex and Simon and Z, uh, they hung out in a shopping mall for a while. Then they got chased in, uh, around in a car. And now they found themselves in um, a, sub, a subway tunnel, basically. We call it the underground here. Um, in America, it's the subway. In this book, it's the metro for some reason. I can't remember why we decided on that. And that's the French system. But anyway, there you go. Uh, the underground system. And um, And they've started walking through the tunnels for the underground trains. And they're realising that something or someone has been down here before them and has basically just carved people to pieces. I forgot how gruesome and bloody this book is. Um, so they found a lot of dead bodies and they don't really know what's happening. And um, and the last line uh, was that the last chapter was basically Alex saying, you know, trouble just has a funny way of finding us. And he's not wrong. So now they are inside... Um, God, my head. Ah! Um, they are inside... It's like one of the warden's creations um behave or you're going to solitary confinement <laughs> i'm sorry about that window it's so bright here there we go okay as long as i don't move too much we'll be all right okay um yeah this window is so blindingly bright i need to get a blind for it um but uh yeah I haven't got around to it yet so sorry for fading in and out Okay, and the next chapter is called Ambush. We descended the steps slowly, every muscle tense, ready to defend ourselves. We didn't know what was down there, but if experience had taught us anything, it was to expect the worst. Z had taken the lead, but when he reached the bottom, he stopped and motioned for me to proceed. Uh, I don't want to cause them too much damage, he whispered with a nervous grin, flexing his non-existent biceps. I wasn't in the mood to laugh. Stepping past him onto the platform. The noises were even louder down here, but the wide staircase blocked our view. Only the strange shadow puppet show on the wall continued, a parade of phantom limbs and elongated torsos. Forget it. A voice pulled itself out, itself out of the cacophony, louder than the rest. You saw those things up there. You want to die, then go ahead, bruv, but I ain't with you. The shouts rose in pitch, a dozen people arguing. I was surprised to hear a female voice in there too, the sound so alien to me after Furnace that at first I didn't recognise it. We moved cautiously around the staircase, the other half of the platform sliding into view. The first thing I saw was three inmates in torn overalls, two leaning against the wall and another, a skull, pacing back and forth, a rifle gripped in his white-knuckled hands. He pointed it across the platform towards something out of sight, his finger wrapped around the trigger. I told you to shut the hell up, he said, his voice desperate and broken. This ain't none of your concern. I took a few more steps, lifting my arms into the air and <coughs> coughing gently. The prisoner with the gun spun around and loosed a shot, the bullet flying up and gouging a chunk of concrete from the ceiling. The sound seemed to startle him as much as everyone else, and he almost lost his grip on the weapon. He blinked furiously, seeming to recognise us, but if anything, this made him even more wary. Hell are you doing here? he yelled. The other inmates had pushed themselves up from the wall and were backing away. Looks like one of them, said a small blonde-haired kid. Shoot it! Whoa, I said, raising my arms even higher. We're with you. We don't want any trouble, okay? 
The skull looked me uh, looked at me down the barrel of the rifle, using his free hand to wipe the sweat from his nose. He squinted and lowered the gun a fraction. You're him, he said. You're the one who got us out. I nodded, and his face suddenly opened up into a crooked smile. Ah, oh, sure glad to see you. You guys alone? I nodded, letting my arms fall to my sides as I walked around the stairs. There was a small group of people cowering in the corner of the platform, two middle-aged men in suits holding briefcases, a younger guy in builder's fluorescence, and a girl about my age. They were all looking at the floor, glassy-eyed and terrified. All except for the girl, that was. She glared at me with such intensity that I had to turn away. Can't be too careful, said the skull, pointing the gun at the floor. You seen what's going on up there? Police everywhere, Z replied, stepping past me and offering a half-hearted wave at the group. Nearly got us. The skull <laughs> snorted, but it was the blonde kid who spoke next. Ain't talking about the cops, he said. You not seen nothing else out there? Not heard nothing weird? Like what? I asked. Like those things back in the prison, said the skull. Those monsters. We got jumped by one. It took three of us. It started... It started to... He let the, fall, the words fall into silence, swallowing hard. Berserkers, I asked. The same ones from Furnace. All three inmates shook their heads. Ain't seen this bastard before, said the skull. Forget it, OK, Simon said, swallowing nervously. We're just here to catch a train. Heading north. Be fewer cops out there. Good plan, boss, the skull shrugged, looking at the tracks. Won't be catching no train here, though. Why is that? I asked. The skull didn't answer. He just turned to the tunnel at the end of the platform. I started to ask my question again, but a soft squeal surrounded by dull thunder cut me off. The sounds grew in volume, accompanied by a light that bloomed in the shadowed archway. It got brighter and brighter before solidifying into a pair of headlights that tore from the opening and blasted towards us. The train ripped past so fast that it took my breath away, sucked through the other tunnel like it had been hoovered up. That's why, the skull said, you want to try and climb on board that? You be my guest. Come every five minutes or so, but they don't stop. Not for us. Must have set up a quarantine, Z said quietly. All around this area, trains won't be stopping here or any of the nearby stations. Arrgh! He stamped his foot. And they've kept the trains running up here, which means we can't even walk the lines. So what do we do? Simon asked. Head up, take the streets? Might be far enough out by now. Nope, said the skull. Not getting out that way either. All the exits are sealed up tight. We tried them. Popo out there. They'll gun you down the second you poke your noses out. Why aren't they coming in? Z asked, directing the question to me. Storm in the place. They've got enough to deal with on the streets, the skull said. Something real strange going on up there. Inmates going wild. You surprised? Z asked. First time they've been free in a long time. They're bound to go crazy. No, not what I mean, the boy continued. They're going wild like... like animals. Didn't seem human no more. You see the bodies? The blonde kid asked. Cops killed, torn to pieces, but the inmates didn't take no guns. It's like they were rabid or something, tearing each other to pieces as well as the popo. Rats? Z asked, looking at me. How did they get out so fast? Doesn't matter, I replied, confused. The rats had been shut down in the tunnels beneath Furnace, along with the warden. There was no way they could have broken out this quickly. I looked at the skull. What's your plan? How are we going to get out of here? That's what we were just talking about, he replied. We're fresh out of ideas, but now you're here, you can tell us what to do, right? You need to hand yourselves in came a voice from the corner. I glanced up at the girl, her expression twisted by rage. Her fists were clenched by her sides, and she looked like she could take down all of us single-handed if she wanted to, before it's too late. We'll take it under advisement, said Blondie with a shy smile. She scowled at him, and looked like she was about to say something else when a noise broke free behind us, that same clownish giggle. <laughs> that we'd heard before, scraping over the tiles like fingernails down a blackboard. The skull aimed his rifle up the stairs, his face a mask of fear. They found us, he hissed. You brought him with you. Led him right here. Who? Z asked, stepping behind me. What's up there? The air suddenly grew thin, replaced by a thunder that flooded the platform as another train tore past, seeming to snatch all the oxygen from the air before disappearing with a scream. The laughter came again, 
<laughs> mixed with the echoes of the train into a nightmare serenade. It was followed by the thump of bare feet overhead, something big heading our way. I felt the adrenaline in my veins, felt the nectar start to do its job. I knew what would happen. It would cloud my mind, make me stronger and faster, capable of doing terrible things. But it would also try to make me forget who I was. It would try to turn me into a monster. Get ready, I heard myself say, the words coming out as a throbbing growl. Hear it? Something blasted from the top of the stairs, a hulking black shape that crashed down them so fast it was just a blur. The inmates cried out in fear, skittering back across the platform as the immense, knuckled form rolled across the floor towards us. The skull fired his rifle, the bullet flying wide and punching a hole in a coffee shop window, but the figure kept coming, bladed limbs carving in the air, threatening to dice us all. I threw myself at it, but I'd only taken a few steps before it stopped doing a couple of clumsy somersaults before skidding to a halt on a bed of black blood, its long limbs flopping uselessly beside it. I saw its face and recognised it instantly. The creature was just as I remembered, rigid and scarred as though it had been carved from rosewood, one eye pure molten silver, the other lost in the gaping wound I had punched into its mangled skull with a pickaxe. It was the berserker, the beetle black one that I'd fought inside the prison. And it was dead. I thought you said... I started. There was another burst of childish laughter from above us. Then something huge leaped over the handrail from the top of the steps and crunched onto the platform, hard enough to create a cobweb of cracks in the concrete. Everybody scattered back like bowling pins, and past them I saw a creature sitting on its haunches, nothing but a ball of tortured muscle. Then it straightened, its body unfolding to an impossible height, towering three feet above me. From a distance it could have passed for human, flesh that was so dark it looked sunburned, its arms and legs bulging but in proportion, its torso covered with a network of scars and dressed only in a pair of faded grey shorts. But the more I studied the beast, the more I realised that although it may once have been human, it was something much worse now. Its hands were huge, far too big for its arms, and swollen into clubs. There was something wrong with its bones, jutting up as if it was wearing a suit of armour beneath its flesh. And between the blades I could see its muscles moving, as though there were snakes in there, desperately trying to find a way out. Its face, though. Its face was the most horrific thing about it, not because it was disfigured or because it was unrecognisably alien, because it was a face of a child, swollen, yes, and bruised, but a kid's nonetheless. Nine years old, maybe ten. It swivelled on those giant shoulders, wearing an infant grin so permanent that it could have been painted on. Nectar dripped from that grin, as though a tap had been turned on inside its mouth, splashing down the front of its body and leaving a trail on the tiles. The creature studied us all with eyes that flashed gunmetal grey. Beside me the skull fired again, the bullet thudding him to the berserker's chest, hard enough to rock it backward. The creature peered down at the wound, with more from curiosity than any sign of pain and the skin around the ragged hole began to pulse black, revealing a network of veins. In seconds it was sealed by a plug of nectar, the berserker flexing its grotesque muscles and grinning at me with that mannequin smile. It laughed. <laughs> a giggle that danced up my spine. There was no warmth in that laugh, no sympathy, sympathy only madness and cruelty. Run! I yelled, but before the word had even left my mouth the berserker was on the move, covering a quarter of the platform in one bound. With another cackle of delight it swiped Z out of the way, sending him flying over the ledge onto the rails below. Wrapping its other hand around my head and neck, I felt my tendons stretch to breaking point as it lifted me off the ground, only half noticing that Simon was gripped in its other fist. The berserker pulled us closer, its jaw distending impossibly wide like a snake preparing to devour its prey. Its whole face seemed to stretch with the movement, its eyes drooping as the skin beneath them was pulled down, its cheeks almost tearing with the effort. Inside its maw were jagged blocks of rotten enamel that had once been teeth, and its breath smelled like the charnel room inside furnace, like it was engulfing me with death. 
Then it leaned forward and sank those teeth into my neck. My vision sparked, black explosions that slowly erased the creature and the platform from view. The berserker pulled free its barbed teeth, and the last thing I saw was its eyes, pale silver and filled with black tears. Then the darkness swallowed me. <sighs> Visions. The first thing I realised was that I was hanging in midair, a hundred of metres or so above the earth. And the first thing I saw was a building. It rose from a burning city, silhouetted against a sky that was so cloudy and so dark it could have been forged from obsidian. Smoke roiled against the encroaching night, and in those coiling tendrils I saw shapes. Twisted bodies that swarmed over the streets below, that leaped effortlessly from rooftop to rooftop, that crouched in dark corners, gnawing on hidden, fe hidden feasts. Every time I tried to focus on one of those forms, it vanished, becoming smoke once again. The building was alight as well, smoke pouring up from the windows like inverted waterfalls. I studied it, tr trying to work out where I'd seen it before. It was an office block, similar to all the rest, a tombstone of concrete and glass that rose maybe 40, 50 storeys from the inferno at its feet. Crowning the structure was a short, four-sided spire, like a pyramid, although against the smoke-stained, blood-reddened sky it looked more like a pyre. I tried to breathe, but hot air, devoid of oxygen, filled my lungs. I struggled but I couldn't move. Somewhere, behind the illusion of the city, I could still see the creature that held me, fizzing in and out of existence every time I blinked. I twisted my body, trying to find a way to escape the berserker's grasp, but even if I could have done so, the flames beneath me extended in every direction for as far as I could see, as if the whole world was burning. It is, somebody said, the voice so loud and so close that it was as though the dying city had spoken. The whole world is an inferno. It will burn until every nation has fallen, until all who oppose us are dead, until people see the true light. The building ahead was getting bigger, growing from its bed of fire. Oh, no, it wasn't getting bigger. It was getting closer, pulling us towards it with some malevolent gravity. As the voice spoke, the tower block grew brighter, the windows near the top coming alive and glowing with a sickly yellow light. I was still too far away to make out what lay inside, but I could see shapes there, as deformed and demented as those I'd glimpsed in the smoke below. I fought against the grip, but I was powerless, dragged relentlessly up towards the building's spire. What do you want? I screamed, though all that emerged was a whisper, strangled by smoke. You know what I want, the voice replied. It was distorted, comprising the roar of flames and the crack of breaking bones, but I knew who it was. There was no mistaking the tone of Alfred Furness, filled with power yet tinged with insanity. We showed you, Warden Cross and I, we showed you what the future would bring, and here it is, a world in flames, and a new race ready to emerge from the ashes. I thought back to my time in the tunnels beneath the prison, when the Warden was turning me into one of his soldiers, into a black suit. He had spoken of a war, a judgment day where the strong would destroy the weak once and for all, a new fatherland that would stand for ten thousand years. I had almost been ready to become part of it, my mind washed of all sense by the nectar, my body butchered and rebuilt. I had almost staked my place in this new world, given myself to Furnace and his legion. And you still can. The voice went on, reading my thoughts. You betrayed me, but you also betrayed yourself. Would you deny yourself a role in a world born from strength, from victory? Look, Alex, and see what awaits you if you answer my call. I peered down into the smoke, churning like an ocean between the burning buildings. The shapes there were clearer now, row upon row of faceless soldiers marching down the street, goose-stepping towards the tower block. Their bodies were puffed out, packed tight with muscle, their eyes piercing silver blades that cut open the wall of smoke before them. Everything about this force smacked of power, of determination, of strength, of victory and I felt the emotion vomit up from my stomach. 
Is it not better to be a soldier in the new world than to be a corpse in the old? Furness went on. You continue to surprise me, Alex. You have fought with courage. You are the kind of soldier who can change this pathetic little world and make it something wonderful. You are the kind of soldier who can fight at my right hand. And I need a new commander, Alex, because my old friend the warden has disappointed me. A man who can't keep his house in order doesn't deserve to have a roof over his head. The small nugget of pleasure I got from hearing him insult the warden was lost almost as soon as it appeared. I wanted to scream at him to tell him that I'd never join his army, but I couldn't find the strength. Or was it something else? My stomach was still churning, my head ringing, and I knew it wasn't from fear. It was excitement. I felt the same terrifying rush as when the warden had shown me what it would be like to crush my enemies between my heel to break their bones and leave their smouldering corpses in my wake. It was power, pure and simple. Oh, and it felt good. There couldn't have been much ne nectar left inside me, but what little was there began to thump through my veins, turning my blood black and filling my thoughts with violence. I tried to fight it, but as I pictured myself storming through the streets, the entire world on its knees begging me for mercy, I found myself grinning, a dull rumble of a growl escaping my throat. See them weep, Alex, Furness said, his voice emanating from the tower block like a pulse. See them plead, for I am their new emperor and you their new prince. It suddenly dawned on me where I'd seen the tower before. In the city, of course, its spire visible on the skyline, replicated in countless postcards and posters. We were closer to it now, and through the windows I caught a glimpse of what lay within. In every room was an operating theatre, decorated with blood and crammed to bursting point with wheezers. The creatures breathed through their ancient gas masks, parting flesh with filthy fingers and screeching with delight. I don't know how many windows there were, uh, dozens maybe, hundreds, but there were all portraits of death and decay as Furnace churned out more soldiers for his force of freaks. Side with me or side against me, he said as we drew inexorably closer. This vision is the truth of the world. Your antics inside the prison have forced me to play my hand a little earlier than I would have liked, but no matter. Perhaps you've done me a favour, boy, in making me act now. He laughed, the throb of his lunatic chuckle making the fires rage even more fiercely. Perhaps when the last cities fall and the people embrace me, then it is you I will be thanking for giving me the opportunity to lay the foundations of the new world now. Yes, Alex, because of you, the war begins this morning. The future starts today. Look at it, Alex, and tell me which side you would rather be on. Look at it and make your choice. My lungs were empty, crying out for air, but even if they hadn't been, I couldn't have given Furnace an answer. We were nearly at the spire, and as we approached, I saw yet another nightmare emerge through the smoke through the shimmering haze of the heat. A creature was clinging to the sloped roof with hands like blades, bigger than any berserker, its body strangely distorted as though its limbs had been stretched on a rack, its skin shimmering as the nectar pulsed through its veins. Oh, and its eyes, those twin silver moons, radiated a power and a strength that cut through everything else, that shone like Beacons, like twin beams from a lighthouse, dousing the flames and blasting the smoke away until the city gleamed as if new and the skies blazed blue. Furnace. Alfred Furnace. The creature had to be him. The creature howled, a cry loud enough to rock the world to its knees. Then it began to laugh, a noise which faded into birdsong over the newborn paradise beneath my feet. Look at it, Alex. Make your choice. But I couldn't. Even as the air flooded back into my lungs, even as my senses returned, I couldn't give an answer, because right then I honestly didn't know the truth. I couldn't make a choice. I honestly didn't know which side I'd pick.
nectar. Tea is basically my nectar. The vision of the city began to clear, dissolving back into reality like sugar in tea. tea. But the reality was no better than the illusion had been. I blinked the tears from my eyes to see the berserker in front of me, its drooping clown's face inches from my own, its fingers wrapped around my neck. It was grinning, the lips forced open so wide I thought they must have been stitched that way, nectar still dribbling out between them. Then, with another infant laugh, it released its hold on me. I dropped like a stone, landing on my back and gasping in a lungful of stale air. I clamped my hands to my throat, feeling the ridge of bite marks there. There was no blood. The nectar had seen to that, but the whole side of my face and neck was itching madly, as though somebody was running a feather duster down the inside of every vein. Simon was beside me, his back arched in agony. My entire upper body was throbbing, as though I'd been cooked alive in the flames of my hallucination, but somehow I found the strength to sit up and focus on what was happening. The berserker seemed to have forgotten all about us. It bounded down the platform, running on all fours like an orangutan, as it closed in on the fleeing inmates. It was on them in seconds, swinging its hammer fists down in a horizontal, oh sorry, along in a horizontal arc and knocking the blonde kid and his quiet friend away. They rolled over the edge of the platform like ragdolls, accompanied by the clack of breaking bones. The sight of them on the lines made me remember Z. I scrambled across the concrete on my knees, peering over the edge of the platform to see a motionless shape below. The lower part of his face was a mask of blood, but I could tell by the pale blue eyes that it was Z. They were open, and they weren't blinking. He must have hit the electrified rail. I knew it. For a second I, I didn't feel anything. Then a blinding flash of white light popped in the centre of my head, expanding hot and fast like a supernova. Not him! I screamed inside. Not him! Not Z! Not Z! With each plea, the flare of the supernova darkened, the nectar numbing the emotions the way it was supposed to, killing the sadness the same way it killed the physical pain. I let my guard drop, willing the poison in, urging it on, so that I wouldn't have to deal with the truth of what lay before me, the body broken and slumped on the tracks. The body that was moving. Oh, are you going to kneel there all day? Came a whisper of a voice, strained as though he'd been badly winded. Or do you think maybe you could give me a hand? The words flushed the nectar from my head, leaving me with nothing but a blinding pulse of agony so deep that it felt as if it had always been there. But more than that, I felt joy. The sensation was so strong that pearls of tears clustered in my eyes. I looked at Z open-mouthed and wide-eyed, and my expression must have been a sight because he laughed. Jesus, Alex, close your mouth before you dribble on me, he said, glancing at the rail beside him, the one he'd missed by a hair's breadth. I cast a look over my shoulder, just to make sure the berserker hadn't changed its mind. It had pinned the skull against a wall, its massive hands held out on either side of it to stop the kid from running. Not that he was going anywhere. He was hunkered into a ball, his arms hanging uselessly by his sides, no blood left in his face as he waited for the monster to attack. I heard a distant squeal, the rattle of the tracks. The air was trembling, as if it was scared of the bullet of metal and glass that was tearing this way. Not wasting another second, I eased myself over the platform and dropped into the pit between the rails, grabbing Z under the armpits. Oh crap, he said as I was hoisting him up. I followed his line of sight to see that the tunnel was growing lighter, two headlights visible and getting bigger with terrifying speed. I threw Z up towards the platform, but his foot caught on the nearest rail and he cried out in pain. I lost my grip and he slipped back into the pit. I took him by the scruff of the neck, using the last of my strength to hurl him upwards just as the train exploded out of the tunnel. I crouched, the sheer velocity of the oncoming engine almost enough to make me drop down dead from fear. In the blink of an eye it had reached me, and as I leaped for safety, I saw the driver's face inches away, frozen into a rictus of panic. I almost made it. 90% of me over the threshold of the platform, but the train was too fast, clipping my legs at 40 miles per hour. I cartwheeled like a spinning top, the world unravelling as I flipped end over end and came crashing to a halt at the foot of the stairs. Even when I stopped, 
The world was still moving, my brain a gyroscope that threatened never, ever to come. I screwed my eyes shut, feeling like I was on a white-knuckle ride at an amusement park, my stomach threatening to hurl even though it was empty. Through the confusion, I heard the berserker's spine-chilling laughter and I forced myself to look. The beast was still in the far corner, although the view was spinning so much that I could barely tell which end of the platform was which. It now had the skull clasped between its bulging palms, and for a bizarre moment I thought it was kissing the kid. Then I realised its embrace was something far worse. The berserker had its jaws locked around the boy's throat, its blunt teeth in his flesh. There was blood dripping down the kid's prison overalls, but even from where I was lying I could see that it was black, not red. The nectar dripped onto the floor, forming a pool beneath the freak and its prey. It might have just been my imagination, but it looked different from the nectar I'd seen back in the furnace, the poison that had been pumped into me by the warden. The flecks of colour in the darkness weren't silver and gold, but red, like splinters of rubies. You see in that, Simon said, and I realised he was kneeling beside me, one hand on my shoulder. Z was crawling towards us, the strength returning slowly to his limbs, but his face as pale as wet paper. What's it doing? Feeding, I said, although I knew this wasn't true. Can you walk? Simon asked. I nodded, but to be honest, I wasn't sure if I could move at all. My legs felt like rubber that had been stretched too far, still no pain as such, just that infuriating itch. We should get out of here before that thing finishes doing whatever it's doing. With a sucking sound that reminded me of a foot being wrenched from mud, the berserker pulled its teeth free of the kid's neck. The wound that it had left was as black as pitch, a ring of ragged holes that reached from ear to shoulder, reminding me of a shark bite. The red-flecked nectar was still dripping, but it looked like it was dripping upwards as well as to the floor below. I blinked in disbelief, squinting into the shadows to see that it wasn't leaking from the boy's neck at all. It was spreading beneath his skin, radiating outwards like channels of dirty water beneath ice. Was that what it had done to me? No, it had bitten me, but it hadn't pumped me full of nectar. Not like this. I'd have felt it. The skull, still held by the berserker, began to tremble, his entire body rocked by spasms so violent that I thought he was going to shake himself to pieces. His veins were pulsing with the nectar inside them, resembling a cobweb of black lines that slowly spread over his face and beneath the collar of his overalls. He thrashed for a moment longer, then he arched backwards, unleashing a desperate, deafening howl at the ceiling. His eyes snapped open, and I could see that they were black wells, so deep and so dark that they could have been hollow pits inside his face. The skull's cry went on for what felt like forever, filling the platform with white noise. Then his head lolled on his shoulders, his eyes looking right at me. I stared into those sockets as tears of ink drew down his cheeks, black blood leaking from his nose and joining the fluid that gushed from his mouth. It looked as if he'd been pumped full of nectar, so much so that it had split open his skin, gushing out of every pore. The berserker laughed again. Then it hoisted the skull over its shoulder as though the boy was nothing but a sack of meat. With a single leap, it threw itself over the platform and back towards the stairs, not even sparing us a look as it crouched and propelled itself upwards, landing on the top step. It paused there for a second, as if to get its bearings. And as it did so, the skull lifted his head and gazed down the stairs through those black, blood-blackened eyes. I could see the fabric of his overall stretch and split as the limbs inside grew, his fingers bulging out joint by joint like sausages fattened and fly-blown. His face too was almost unrecognisable, swollen like a month-old corpse. But even though the kid had been disfigured beyond repair, even as his face began to warp and split like old wood, there was no denying the expression there. His eyes, as dark as they were, were hungry and his mouth was twisted up manically, maniacally I think I should say, the lips drawn, teeth glinting against the nectar. He was smiling. Mm. I did promise you a longer one today, so I hope we can get another one in. Just have a sip of nectar. Here we go. 
feeding. We sat at the foot of the stairs, long after the slap of the berserker's footsteps had faded, long after we heard the last echo of its sinister toddler's giggle ebb from the passageways above us. We sat there in silence, trying to make sense of what we'd seen, trying to get our heads around this bizarre new twist. The platform was deathly silent, no sign of life from the two other inmates who'd been knocked onto the tracks. Z had been lucky, and I offered a silent prayer. It was about time we'd had a little luck. The angry girl was peeking out from the doorway of the coffee shop, but there was no sign of the other civilians. We should probably go, Z said. He was sitting on the bottom step, rubbing his right leg. His new jeans had been torn open, but I couldn't see any blood there, just a bruise that was blossoming on his calf. Go where? I asked, struggling to find the strength to move my mouth. My neck was stinging furiously where I'd been bitten, as if I'd been rolling in nettles. The sensation was migrating down my right arm, the skin there tender to the touch. Nobody answered. And what could they say? I mean, if Furnace had sent in his berserkers, freaks like the one that had just been down here, then we wouldn't be safe anywhere. Hell, nobody would be safe with those things running, running amok. I thought about my vision, the image of the city in flames. I tried to work out what Furnace had been talking about. What had he said? The war begins this morning, Simon whispered, as if reading my mind. I looked at him and he glanced back at me almost shamefully. You saw it too? I asked. So what? Z said as Simon nodded. What did I miss? Trust me, said Simon. You don't want to be part of this club. He looked up the stairs, then at me. You think what he said was true? About the city? About the war? Guys! Z snapped. We had a vision, I explained. It was Alfred Furness talking to us. I don't know how exactly, but... The nectar, Simon interrupted. He talks to us through the nectar, I guess. It's like he's right there inside my head, I said. Like he's in there screaming. It's not possible, but that's what it feels like. It feels like he could just dig his fingers into my brain and make me do anything he wanted. Only uh, he can't do that, right? Z said. Otherwise he'd have just killed you, made you commit suicide or something. He may be talking to you, but he can't control you. Right, I muttered back, unconvinced. Anyway, what did you see? Z asked. The city in flames, Z Simon said full of monsters. Did you see that freak on the tower right at the end? Yeah, I replied, picturing the beast as it howled at the streets below, looking like it was ready to tear the world apart, brick by brick, bone by bone. That was Furnace, right? That was one evil looking hombre. You're not wrong there, Simon went on. If I never have to come face to face with him in the flesh, then it will be too soon. He turned back to Z. He said it was our fault that his creatures were loose, our fault that he has to start his war today. War, Z said. That doesn't make any sense, unless he's declaring war on us, the prisoners. I tried to think back over my hallucination, but it was fragmenting like a dream, erased by consciousness. Maybe Z was right. Maybe that's all he meant, a war against the kids who'd escaped from his institution. That had to be it, didn't it? My head was still reeling and I felt my body give in to gravity, lying back against the stairs. I tried to sit up straight, but I just didn't have the strength. It felt like all my bones had been stolen. He was giving us the same old crap, I went on, struggling to find the energy to breathe in. Telling us he'd forgive us if we just gave ourselves in, that we could help him fight, that we could be his new right hand men, blah blah blah. At least he was slagging off the warden. It was worth it just to hear that. I think that bastard cross might have had his day. I looked at Simon and realised he'd lost even more colour. He flicked me a glance, too quick for me to make out the look in his eyes. Uh, he didn't say... Uh, he began, then stopped and turned away, staring at the wall. I ignored him, feeling my neck turn to jelly, my head dropping against the chipped tiles of the steps. If I could just rest here for a bit, then maybe I'd be okay. Or maybe this was it. Maybe my body had finally run out of fuel. Perhaps it wouldn't be so bad if it all ended here, I thought. At least it was quiet. At least I was with friends. I closed my eyes. <sighs> Did Furnace say anything else? Asked Z, making me jump. I don't think so, I slurred, too tired to remember. The tower, Simon said. The tower the beast was standing on. What sort of tower? Z said. I heard Simon shrug before he said, oh, It was an office block in the city. I think it must be his. All kinds of sick stuff going on inside. There was more, but I zoned out, my thoughts covered by a pleasant blanket of darkness and quiet. 
The stinging in my neck and my arm had settled into a deep, buzzing pulse that beat in time with my heart. I don't know how much later it was that I felt hands on me, shaking me hard. I tried to open my eyes, but I couldn't. The sudden terror of paralysis turning my blood to ice water. I struggled against the grip of sleep, eventually managing to peel my eyelids open. But that was pretty much all I was capable of. You look like crap, Z said. It's the nectar, Simon replied. It's running out. What happens if it does? Bad things, Simon said. Seen it happen to the rats, back down in furnace. If the nectar dries up, then all the crap that's happened, all the wounds and broken bones, it fast catches up with you. And Alex here, he's been beaten to death and back, I don't know how many times. If he runs out of nectar, he runs out of time. I tried to comment, but my words were still locked tight by tiredness. Somewhere in the conversation, my eyes had closed and I hadn't even noticed. This time, the darkness was far from comforting. It felt a bit like I was being buried alive. So what do we do? Z asked, his voice laced with desperation. I realised he had his hand on my head and the touch felt good. I'm pretty sure Mickey D's hasn't started offering nectar shakes yet. What do we do? <sighs> Something gross, Simon said. I heard the scuff of feet as he left the steps, followed shortly by a sound that could have been a lobster claw being pulled from the socket. A disgusting symphony of cracks and slurps and grunts. No way, said Z. That's just wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Yeah, but we don't have a choice, Simon said. I heard him swallow something, then gag, then swallow again. If he doesn't get some more nectar into his system, then he's going to die. If not now, then pretty soon. I look at him. I sensed Simon standing before me, and I felt something drip onto my neck, tickling my skin as it ran beneath my hoodie. Open wide, said Simon. I did as I was told, feeling another drip on my chin as he held something over my head. The next drop of liquid struck my tongue, bringing with it the foulest taste I've ever experienced, as if all the food in a fridge had been left for years until it was covered in mould and putrefied to a mush, a liquefied mess of sour, lumpy milk and maggot-infested beef. I felt my throat close up, my stomach heaving, but Simon held my mouth open with one hand and kept pouring in whatever it was he had in the other. I swallowed, only to stop myself from choking. The instant I did, the disgusting taste was forgotten as my brain recognised what the substance was. My pulse shifted up a gear, hammering in my ears. Even though my eyes were still closed, my vision went blacker, tiny pinpoints of golden light sparking like exploding stars against the night. It was nectar. Somehow, Simon was feeding me nectar. It hit my stomach like a living thing, like it had a mind of its own and knew exactly where to go. It felt like it channelled itself instantly through my gut and into my arteries, lining them with lightning and bringing my exhausted muscles back to life. The wound in my neck was on fire, although burning with power, not pain. The sensation seemed to spread down my right arm all the way to my fingers, as if the veins there had been stretched and widened to hold as much of the poison as possible. I gulped harder, <coughs> craving the liquid that filled my mouth, like this was my first glass of water after a month in the desert. I didn't care about the taste, I just wanted more of it. It filled me up like fuel, my body and engine suddenly gunning and ready to go. I sat upright with a choked growl, opening my eyes and looking through the pulsing black veins of my retinas to see a severed limb over my head. <coughs> I recognised the boy who held it, but all memories were obliterated by the need for nectar. I lashed out at him, grabbing the arm and pressing my face to the leaking veins, sucking the nectar out with relish. <laughs> In seconds it was dry, and with another guttural roar I leaped to my feet, pouncing on the corpse of the beetle black berserker and tearing into its cold carapace. Somewhere. In the frenzy, I heard a voice telling me to slow down, telling me not to drink too much. I didn't know if it was somebody else or if it was me, that same internal thought that had kept me sane back in the prison. I ignored it, sucking poison from the torn cavity of the creature beneath me, filling my belly with nectar. That infuriating hunger that I'd felt for what seemed like forever was gradually being sated, every cell of my being turning from a dry, useless husk into a swollen vessel of power. I raised my head from the corpse and let my dripping mouth hang open. 
a noise escaped me, a roar that came of its own accord. I lifted the dead berserker, now as light as cotton wool, using both hands to tear the cadaver in two. I threw the bloody pieces away, turning to the platform to find something else to test my strength on, something else to destroy. The nectar was screaming at me, sluicing through my brain and shrieking a single word with each pulse. Kill, kill, kill. And on top of that, the sound of laughter resonating in my head, a low, deep cackle that I knew belonged to Alfred Furness. You have made your choice, he said, the nectar carrying his voice into the deepest reaches of my soul, the words born on another wave of mirth. They seemed to sprout into visions, images that blossomed into full bloom, me at the head of an army, raining hell down onto the world, me locked in combat with somebody who looked like the warden but who couldn't be. Whatever you do from this moment on, whatever path you decide to take, you have made your choice. I clamped my hands to my ears, but it did no good. Furnace was howling as though he had torn open my skull and stepped inside. The nectar carried on flowing, healing my wounds, turning my muscles to rock, smashing through my thoughts like china plates. I searched the pieces, trying to keep my mind, but all I could hear was that endless laughter, like thunder, and that same relentless order, telling me to kill. If I obeyed, maybe it would make the madness stop. I scoured the platform, saw two faces I knew but at the same time didn't. They weren't worth my time. Turning, I saw the girl watching from the doorway. She'd do. I no longer knew what I was doing, crossing the platform in three giant strides until the pathetic creature was beneath me. She heard me coming, scrambling to her feet and holding her hands up to protect her face. Her eyes glared at me, still full of fight, never wavering. You wanted to help her. Oh, sorry. You wanted to help her. That was Alex's voice. Remember? You wanted to save her. More voices in my head, all fighting each other, contradicting each other. And the only way to banish them was to make that choice, to take a life. I raised my hands, ready to twist her neck like a chicken's, to end it once and for all. But still, she fought me with that gaze. Two piercing points of white light that held me back as firmly as a hand on my chest. She's looking at you like you're one of them, but you're not one of them, Alex. You're not one of them. You're not one of them. You're not. I threw my head into my hands, the voices jumbling together into an insane chorus. I screamed against my palms, only half noticing that there were words in there. Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? I lifted my fist again, knowing that all it would take was one simple movement and the girl would be dead. Then Furnace would be right. My choice would have been made. I wouldn't have to fight anymore. To my side came the sound of an explosion as a train flew from the tunnel, the deafening noise, the final straw. I moved fast, faster than I'd ever moved, turning, screaming as my fist descended like a guillotine blade, driven earthwards by the nectar, by its nightmare desire to destroy train was almost gone, but I caught the end of it, <laughs> my fist punching through the last window in the last carriage, the force of the blow so great that it reduced the plexiglass to splinters, tearing a chunk from the metal frame. The impact felt as though it had ripped my arm right out of its socket, dragging me along the platform on my heels. But it was the train that lurched, the carriages rocking against one another, almost hard enough to pull it from the tracks. With an ear-shattering squeal, it accelerated through the other tunnel, plunging the platform into silence. I dropped to my knees, cradling my fist, the nectar's pounding song beginning to quiet, quenched for now, leaving me alone with my sobs and with the endless echo of his whispered delight. You have made your choice. Right, but since I uh, since I wasn't here yesterday, we'll do one more. Unless my kids come upstairs, of course, in which case we might have to cut it short. But this one is uh, it's, uh, it's a good one. So uh, the next chapter is called a Lucy. Lucy is the name of my oldest daughter. Hi, Lucy. Um, so she was the inspiration for this character. Lucy. It took me a while to realise that somebody was talking. I swam out of a trance, breaking free from the ocean of dark thoughts that I'd been drowning in. I don't know how long it had been since I'd fed. The last few minutes? Maybe hours. Nothing but a blur. 
My hand was itching furiously, and I focused on it to see blades of glass protruding from between the knuckles, surrounded by smudges of greasy black blood. The wounds had already healed, the nectar plugging the holes in my skin, knitting the flesh black to get back together. But there was something more. My hand seemed to have grown, swelling so much that the skin was tight, and an ugly shade of bruised black. It wasn't just my hand either, it was my whole arm. I felt beneath the skin of my hoodie, running all the way up the bulging flesh until I reached the bite mark in my neck. It was pulsing with every heartbeat, and when I lifted my hand away, my fingertips were stained with nectar. Gradually, the rest of the world settled, growing still and clear, as if I'd been looking at a reflection in a disturbed puddle. I was on my knees on the lip of the platform, rats scurrying about below, sniffing curiously at the pools of dark liquid I had left between the rails. My head was ringing, almost loud enough to drown out the words from behind me. I eased my head around to peer over my shoulder, aware that my whole body felt tender. There was no pain, I mean the nectar had made sure of that, but there was something else, a deep-rooted tickling sensation that stretched from my neck down my spine and finished in my hips. I tried to remember what had happened, I had a fleeting image of me bringing my fist down on something. On a girl. As my eyes gradually made sense of the shapes behind me, I saw to my relief that the girl oh, was still there, still alive, sitting on a bench against the wall of the staircase, her head resting against her chest, her hands playing with a small silver medallion that hung around her neck. Z was next to her, although he was perched uncomfortably on the other side of the bench, leaving as much space as possible between him and her. Simon was pacing up and down urgently in front of them, all trace of pain from the gunshot wound in his shoulder now apparently gone. I realised that he must have consumed some nectar too, not much, just enough to patch him up. It was Simon who noticed me first. He flinched when he made eye contact, his entire body stiffening. Then, when he saw that my senses had returned, he relaxed. Welcome back, he said. Hearing his words, both Z and the girl looked over, her face twisting into an expression of terror. She tucked the necklace out of sight, then pushed herself back into the bench, pulling her knees up to her chest. Her eyes were still haunted, still defiant, still fierce. Don't let him near me, she hissed. Don't you dare let him anywhere near me. We told you, Z started, but the girl cut him off. I don't care if he's your friend or not, he's a psycho. You hear me? You're a psycho. I turned away as a fit of dizziness rocked me. Then I swivelled around. Cool. Uh, sorry, I just had a message about, uh, about shopping. Uh, then I swivelled around, um, shuffling away from the tracks. The girl started to protest and I held my hands up in surrender. It's OK, I said, my voice throbbing. I, I won't come near you. I'm sorry. I I'm sorry I scared you. Scared me, she said. You almost killed me. Uh, yeah, then you decided to punch a moving train instead, Z said, raising an eyebrow. I'm not really sure what to say about that. How's your arm? It's uh, fine, I said, his words bringing back the memory. I tugged one of the shards of glass from the soft flesh beneath my knuckle, between my knuckles. It fell to the floor with a tuneful tinkle, followed by a single drop of black blood. I really did punch a moving train. Nectar will do that to you, Simon said. Makes you do crazy things. Better than being dead, though, I think. And you, uh, you fought it. You came back. I almost didn't, I replied. Every time I got a fresh dose of nectar, I toppled a little closer to oblivion. It had happened in the prison when I'd fought those first two berserkers, and it had been worse just now. Christ, I'd, I'd nearly beaten an innocent girl's brains in. How many more times would I have to take the nectar to stay alive? And what would happen when I couldn't find my way back? I'd belong to the warden, and to Alfred Furness, for good. Simon was wrong. That wasn't better than being dead. Anyway, let's forget about it, Z said. You're awake and you've got your strength back. You're going to need it. We're all going to need it. <sighs> I nodded at Z and then nodded an acknowledgement at Simon. Despite everything, he'd probably saved my life by feeding me nectar. I'd been on my last legs. Hell, I'd been on my last everything and I really didn't have my strength back. I got to my feet, my whole body singing, feeling as though it was capable of anything. The girl seemed to press herself further into the bench, so I backed off another few steps, keeping my hands by my side. I wasn't quite sure what to say, and I doubted there was anything I could do to win her over after what had happened. So I settled for an awkward attempt at a smile. Well, this is Alex, Z said. Alex, this is Lucy. 
I thought you'd be running for the hills about now, I said. Lucy wiped her eyes. Oh. <laughs> Lucy wiped her eyes. Oh, God. Lucy wiped her, her eyes, smearing mascara over her cheek. And with her dark hair hanging in untidy strands over her cheeks, it made her look like a goth. She was wearing jeans and a neat blue suit jacket over a Led Zeppelin t-shirt. A pair of scuffed sneakers on her feet. Up close and free of the nectar's malevolent grip, I noticed she was older than I'd first thought. Maybe 16 or 17? You kidding me, she said. With those those things up there, not to mention a prison load of your ex-cellmate. We're not like them, Z said. I told you. Yeah, you're all innocent, you said. Lucy snorted a humorless laugh. You just happened to be walking by and they threw you in furnace. You're all as bad as each other, thugs and killers. Don't try and pretend you're not. My dad was a copper, you know. He'd have sent you all back down there before you'd taken three breaths of fresh air. I wondered how much they'd told her, asking the question out loud. Enough, Simon answered. You were zonked out over there for a good 20 minutes. You told her about the berserkers, I asked, about the experiments. The girl spluttered, scoffing at the story she'd been told, but it was a little difficult to deny, given the evidence, and the way she turned her tired eyes to the floor, her mouth drooping. I could tell she was finding it harder and harder to maintain her disbelief. Told her everything, Z said. Don't think she believed me, but I don't think it matters. She trusts her own eyes. It's impossible, she said. You can't, you can't just make something like that. You can't just turn a... Uh, uh. She sneaked a look at me and gave up, chewing her lip instead told her all about you too, Z went on, that it's not your fault you're, you know, all messed up and everything. Not your fault you'll look like Shrek's uglier brother. Thanks, I muttered. Lucy's head lifted and she must have seen something human in my eyes, or maybe it was because, the, because of the smiley face plastered over my hoodie, because she let her legs unfold, dropping her feet to the platform below. She sat forward, her elbows on her knees, her fingers smearing more mascara over her delicate features. Is that all true? she asked, staring at the scars on my neck, on my face, around my silver eyes. What he said, that they took you apart and put you back together again. You think I was born like this? I said, uncomfortable under her scrutiny. I angled away, raising a hand and pretending to scratch my forehead, leaving it there for longer than it needed to be. None of it matters though, it's all history. All we need to think about is finding a way out of here, out of the city. It's bad up there. Z said, hauling himself off the bench and smoothing down his ripped jeans. Lucy says all the main roads out have been closed off, the main line train stations too. We were told to stay home, she said. It was all over the news, but hardly anyone believed it. It was as bad as they were saying. I couldn't take a day off work. I needed the money. I reckon most people felt the same. Thought the cops wouldn't would get it under control. Thought it was safe enough. She snorted again, this time in disgust. Thought wrong, didn't I? Whole city's in lockdown, Simon mumbled, kicking out an imaginary stone. It's hopeless. May as well stay here until we're rounded up. Till the city burns, I thought with a shudder. Haven't been no train since the one you tried to kill, Z said. Guess they figured it was too dangerous. People on the tracks and stuff. So the tunnels are clear, I asked. There was a round of shrugs. Maybe. Maybe not, Simon said. I don't fancy getting halfway down one then finding out they're just running a bit late. What then? I asked. You didn't think of any amazing plans while I was out? Jeez, guys, what am I paying you for? At this, the girl actually smiled. The smallest twitch of one corner of her mouth, gone a heartbeat later, but a smile nonetheless. Well, feel free to dock my salary, Z said, because I've got zip. As far as I can see it, we can, we can either risk the tunnels, keep heading north for a quieter station, or... Doesn't get much quieter than this, Simon interrupted, looking around the deserted platform. You know what I mean. Z went on. We either try that and risk a train and find ourselves in exactly the same position half a mile closer to the centre of the city, or... Or, Simon and I said together, or we breach the surface now, see what the situation is up top. He peered longingly up the stairs, snatching a ragged breath. If there are cops up there, then we'll have to fight, I guess, but they might be busy with those other things. We might be able to sneak out onto the streets. And then what? I asked. Hot wire a car again? Get the crap shot out of us by another helicopter? Z's shoulders lurched up and down in resignation. Guess it's a risk, he said, but the alternative is to stay here and wait for trouble to come to us, whether it's the cops or another of Furnace's sick freaks. Great, I said. So it's get hit by a train, get shot at by the cops, or get eaten by a mutant kid-faced gorilla. Jesus, what a choice. 
You lot are better off heading up top, Lucy said. If everything you say is true, I don't for a second believe it is. But if even some of it is true, then you should hand yourselves in. Let the court sort it out. Simon pointed a finger at the girl, his face overcast. How do you think we got here in the first place? He said. I'll never give myself back to Furnace. I'd rather die than do that. I felt the same, but Lucy had a point. If the berserkers were up there, if the public had seen them, then there was a chance that people would believe us. At the very least, they'd keep us in a normal jail with windows and televisions and luxuries like that. And then and they'd have to investigate what was been going on in Furnace. It wasn't as if they could shove us back into a burning prison, right? No, things had changed since last night. The world might listen. I started to voice my thoughts when a jolt of pain gripped my neck, cramp twisting the muscles all the way down to my arm. I grabbed it, oh, massaging it with my good hand, feeling the scarred tissue beneath my skin writhe and pulse as if there was something living under there. Something living and growing. What's up? Simon asked, seeing my discomfort. I shook my head, the pain already ebbing. It bit you, didn't it? Z asked. That thing took a chunk right out of your neck. It doesn't matter, I replied. I've been through worse. Come on, what's the plan? Z and Simon shared a look. Then Z spoke. Let's just poke our heads out. Not for long, just to see what's the what. If the streets are crawling, then we'll try the tunnels. Yeah? Either way, we keep heading up into the city and out the other side. I nodded, looking at Simon. He glared at me, wiped his nose with the back of his hand, then shook his head in a way that said he didn't like it, but he'd give it a go. But you're poking your head out first, he said to Z, clipping him around the back of the head. That way, if I see your noggin pop, then I can get mine out of the way. Deal, Z said, setting off up the steps with a weary sigh. Simon followed, and I looked at Lucy. What about you? I asked. Are you going to wait here for the cops? The girl took an uneasy look around her, then jumped to her feet, smoothing down her shirt and making for the stairs. Are you mental? she muttered. That thing might be back at any time. No way, psycho boy. I'm coming with you. Okay, and we're heading back up to the streets. The streets is the next chapter right there. Um, I just heard someone knock on the door, so I am going to run down and see who it was. But thank you very much for joining me. That was an awesome, awesome, uh, I think that's the longest one we've done so far. Um, five chapters, that's a record. So I hope that makes up for me not appearing yesterday. But anyway, have a wonderful day. I will be back tomorrow uh, to carry on our adventures inside, outside Furnace. See you all soon. Bye.